just before we uh, commence, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statement you submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, very welcome this afternoon um, to welcome the organisation SONUS, who are represented today by uh, Ms Fiona Ryan and Professor Stephanie Holt. As I said a moment ago, your submissions have been received and circulated and members have them. So I'll ask you maybe to make the opening statement and then colleagues will have a number of questions for you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I'm conscious that the committee is at the end of a very, very long day. So you'll be very pleased to know that um, I'll be making some just very, very um, simple um, statements to the committee. Um, but I think if they're taken on board and remembered, you have the opportunity to make a real impact. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you. I appreciate that we were, um, we were very much uh, facilitated to be here and uh, we appreciate it. So my name is Fiona Ryan, I'm the Chief Executive of Sunnis Domestic Violence Charity. We're the largest provider of frontline services to women and children um, experiencing domestic violence in the state, although we work predominantly in the Greater Dublin area. Um, I'm delighted that um, I'm accompanied here today by Professor Stephanie Holt from Trinity College Dublin, who is an internationally acknowledged expert in the area of child welfare and protection, and I suppose more laterally has done a lot of research around that intersection of homelessness and child welfare and protection and domestic violence. So uh, in terms of the expertise, I think we're very lucky to have Stephanie here today. And I guess you might very well ask, you know, why is the head of a domestic violence service and an academic here today in front of a housing and homelessness committee to talk to you around um, and about domestic violence? And it's, a, again, a very, very simple answer. Um, you're you are examining the issues of housing and homelessness and you're looking for solutions. And while I can put forward a case, you know, um, of why dom domestic violence, those experienced, when women and children experiencing domestic violence are already at risk of a perfect storm of domestic violence and homelessness. And that's what we're facing out there every day, every minute, right now, on that front line. I'm actually going to start with general homelessness statistics because I think it's really, really important. If I can leave you with one message today, it will be that if you want to find a solution to families entering homelessness, you have to engage with the reality of domestic violence. In a survey of 70 families that became newly homeless in March, one in six said domestic violence was the main cause of their homeless experience. Add that figure to those who had become homeless in the past because of domestic violence, and the figure is closer to one in four. So I just want to kind of leave you reflect on that figure. Because I think, you know, we were discussing this today and obviously when we had the opportunity to go in front of the committee, we were saying, what's the biggest challenge we'll have going in front of this committee? It's not that we didn't think you'd be sympathetic to domestic violence and it's not that we didn't think you'd want to find a solution to homelessness. But we figured our biggest challenge was to say, here's how domestic violence is a leading cause of families becoming homeless. And I leave you with that that thought, one in four newly homeless families are there because of domestic violence. So I guess if you combine this then with the fact that, and you, you will know this because of your own constituency clinics, that 78% of victims do not disclose their experiences to anyone. Then we have a massive hidden problem in terms of unofficial homelessness, and in terms of domestic violence. I think, and Stephanie will speak uh, more to this and authoritatively on this, because what we're talking about here are a particular cohort, the homeless population, that are at 
additional risk. You know, there's a tendency, I think, in Ireland, if you forgive me for digressing, to view domestic violence as we're not comfortable with it. We don't know how to, to figure it. You know, it's something that happens inside the hall door. Um, we haven't quite, even though we have the words, we haven't quite come to terms with the fact that it is a crime. And it is a crime that impacts on women, children and men. But it is a crime that disproportionately impacts on women and children. And it is a crime that disproportionately impacts in terms of the outcomes of women and children. You know, if you want to talk about a crime and prevalence, about what lands someone in an emergency room, what lands someone in intensive care, and unfortunately what lands someone in a morgue, that you're talking about domestic violence. More women have been killed in the last 10 years by partners or in a family context than, um, than gangland killings. But yet if you look at the massive response and in both the public imagination and the statutory response to gangland killings, where's the similar response to women and children experiencing domestic violence? And I think that is that nexus point, that crisis, that, um, that perfect storm that we talk about. Families entering homelessness because of domestic violence who are already at risk. Um, and we're talking about their safety. We're talking about their physical safety. We're not just talking psychological or emotional. We're talking about their physical and mental well-being here. And then we're putting them into homeless services. Because I have to tell you, Sunus um, provides uh, refuge in West Dublin as part of our overall services. And uh, I know a couple, few of the TDs here are from that particular constituency. We're overwhelmed. And as part of the preparation of coming here to, to you today and to do this courtesy, I consulted with other managers of refuges, um, Searsha, Evenus Rat Mines. So between, I mean, so like I said, some of quantum services will cover probably beyond refuge. But in terms of actual refuge providers who, if we're talking about a front line, that they're the ones in the trenches. And frankly, we're overwhelmed. We are turning away five times as many women and children as we can accommodate. They are going to stay with relatives. They are sleeping on floors. And they are showing up in homeless services. So again, I would say to you, there is a distinct link, a causal relationship between domestic violence and families entering homeless services. And I suppose the overwhelming majority of these newly homeless families are female-headed households. We spoke in our submission that, as I said, domestic violence is a crime that disproportionately affects women and children. And so we would say to you, the question has to be asked, how are solutions to families becoming homeless to be found? One of the root causes of women and children becoming homeless is domestic violence, but it's rarely acknowledged. I mean, I doubt anyone who has come before you here to talk about homelessness has even referenced domestic violence. They have. Just for the record. I'm delighted to hear it because it's absent, it's basically absent in national homeless policy. It is maybe referenced um, and to the extent that it, it could be alluded to, but in terms of a cascade, in terms of following actions, in terms of strategy, um, I think it's conspicuous by its absence. And to be frank with you, we're members of the um, Homeless Network, Dublin Homeless Network, and I looked at the submission that they made, and I actually, you know, went back and said, where, where is domestic violence in here? And they said, it's... Of course, domestic violence is a key contributing cause, which is why they gave us that statement. But, you know, it's implied. And I think that's the problem when we're talking about domestic violence and homelessness. There is an understanding that it is understood. But this is Ireland. And if you don't state something explicitly, then you won't have the following actions to address the issue. And I suppose that's what we would say to you. If we do not engage with the reality that domestic violence is a key contributing cause to families becoming homeless, then we will not find that solution. And it will require an intergovernmental response and recognition and engagement by all stakeholders, but in particular the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government. Domestic violence is a key contributing cause of families becoming homeless and a dual approach has to be undertaken. It's not just housing, and this is what differentiates it from mainstream housing policy. We have housing first, and that's great for a particular group of the homeless population, in fact probably majority. And even within, you know, the, those families that experience homelessness and domestic violence, it's a solution for them, for a lot of them. But the reality is that families experiencing, women and children experiencing domestic violence require a number 
of safe accommodation options. Post-refuge accommodation, step-down accommodation, um, that's up to six months. Safe homes in the community. We provide all of this as part of the quantum of services, but we don't have enough. And I think that's something that would differentiate that sort of service provision from general homelessness provision. Again, going back to, you know, <clears throat> some general homelessness recommendations where they talk about a family having a, you know, a centre of interest and trying to house them as close as possible to that centre of interest. That may be diametrically opposed to the safety, welfare and protection of the women and children we work with because they can literally be down the road from the perpetrator and his extended family or associates. So I think we need to be mindful and aware that not one size will fit all and not one solution will fit all. And we need to, if we're really serious about providing those, you know, client-centred, needs-led services and to finding real solutions to homelessness, we need to take this on board. Um, I mentioned in my submission that uh, we are members of the National Monitoring Committee of the second National Domestic Violence, Sexual Violence and Gender-Based Violence um, Strategy. And the Monitoring Committee is meeting for the first time tomorrow. There's a real opportunity, I think, to, for this committee um, to put forward recommendations that can really inform that National Monitoring Committee. I mean, just to get, let you know, in Action 2.3, it does refer to, you know, develop guidance for local authorities with regard to the policy and procedural aspect of their housing role, which will ensure effectiveness and consistency in local authority responses to um, victims of domestic violence. To be frank with you, um, I think that's really welcome, the guidelines, and to have the opportunity for engagement. But I think right now we're facing a real and present crisis. You know, we need to know that we can move this on quicker. We need to know that there is real engagement to be had around what are the accommodation supports women and children actually need. Um, like I said, I'm conscious that um, you know, you're at the end of a long day and you're looking to find solutions. So I would just like the opportunity to leave you with a couple of simple messages, and then, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Stephanie to talk to the issue. So our messages are, it would be difficult to find a solution for families becoming homeless without engaging in the reality of domestic violence and the part it plays in families becoming homeless. Families are leaving home because of domestic violence. Again, I'd remind you of the one in four figure. The homeless re crisis requires a number of solutions. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, no matter how attractive that sounds. I feel like being um, facetious and saying any woman could have told you that, you know. But victims of domestic violence need that variety of options. And right now, the safety, protection and lives of women, children and young people are at risk. I am not being dramatic by saying that to you. You can talk to Angar the Shia Khan, you can talk to frontline workers, you can talk to social workers. This risk is happening and it's being multiplied by their experience of homelessness. And uh, I guess just because we knew we were coming here today, I'd like to read you out a statement from the Dublin Homeless Network. It says, the Dublin Homeless Network, who we already have here, um, acknowledges that domestic violence is a significant cause of women and children and young people coming into and remaining in homelessness. National housing and home strategic responses should incorporate and recognise domestic violence as a significant issue which requires housing-led and other support solutions. I would say that perhaps instead of housing-led, what we are talking about accommodation, because accommodation and safe accommodation is not necessarily the same as housing. And just to let you know, the other organisations because who support our submission and because we only got notification on Friday that we were going before the committee, so we only had a day really, a day and a half, to talk to the other organisations. But just to let you know, all the other domestic violence um, refuge providers in Dublin, Evenus, Searsha and Rat Mines are backing this submission. The National Women's Council of Ireland, Ruhama, the Immigrant Council of Ireland, Safe Ireland Network, who also provided this committee with a submission around domestic violence, and the National Collective of Community-Based Women's Networks have all recognised the call within the submission and would support it. Um, as I said, the National Monitoring Committee of the National Domestic Violence Strategy is meeting tomorrow. Together we have an opportunity to make a real difference to families, to women and children, to young people experiencing domestic violence and homelessness, and to victims. In many cases, the exact same, these are the same people. Let's take that opportunity to make a difference, and hopefully let's make it better. I'm going to hand over to Stephanie now, if that's okay with the committee.
Thanks, Fiona. <coughs> Chair and members of, of the committee, um, thanks for hearing what I have to contribute to this debate. Um, I think I'm going to talk first to an issue that I would have particular expertise in, and that's children's experience of domestic violence, before making some significant links, I suppose, to the area of homelessness, and in particular, significant risks that children can be exposed to as a result of that experience. I think one of the difficulties historically and across all jurisdictions, it's not an Irish ish, ish, issue really, is how do we respond appropriately to the welfare and protection needs of children who are exposed to domestic violence? And that concerns how we understand the issue, really. Um, one of the, and I've three points to make around that, but one of the issues um, has been, I suppose, similar to homelessness and somewhat paradoxically, um, domestic violence has been traditionally seen as an adult affair that doesn't concern children, despite a burgeoning uh, evidence base to the contrary of that that would robustly suggest otherwise. Um, international evidence on the prevalence of children's exposure to domestic violence would say that they're centrally involved in every aspect of that. Uh, domestic violence can be seen as a kind of an episodic, something that happens every now and again. But for the children who experience it, it's something that absolutely pervades their life. It's something that they live with. They live with fear, they live with anger, um, and they live with parents whose parenting capacity um, is somewhat comprom compromised to various degrees. Um, the exposure to domestic violence is also very clearly linked, and there's empirical evidence to support it, to child abuse. Um, at its very basic minimum, living with domestic violence is seen as a form of emotional abuse, and that's reflected in our Children First guidelines. Um, it's also very clearly linked to the physical abuse of children, and to a, a lesser degree to the sexual abuse of children. Um, unfortunately, for those experiencing domestic abuse, it's rarely the only issue that uh, children and young people and families are experiencing. Um, alongside that, there's a multiplicity of other issues, um, which I suppose complicate, the, complicate that experience to some degrees. Um, in that mix are substance abuse, mental health issues for parents, mental health issues for children, very, very seriously disturbed children who are presenting with suicidal ide ideation as a result of that experience. Um, poverty comes with that too, and alongside that, uh, what we're talking about today, homelessness. And I think what that does is it presents this dynamic risk for children that's ongoing and quite difficult to tackle. I think if we focus specifically on the issue of homelessness, um, it is a significant stressor in the lives of children and families. It's both, an, uh, it, it's both an antecedent to homelessness and it significantly adds to the stress that families um, experience. However, being a homelessness, which may arise from the need uh, to leave a violent relationship, also actually significantly, and I think this is a really important point, it elevates the risk for children and the non, their non-abusing parent, which as Fiona has already pointed out, is largely the mother. And it also seriously compromises their safety. That kind of leads me on to the second point, but before I come to my second point, I just want to highlight that uh, the presence of domestic violence is a consistent factor in serious case reviews in both the UK and here in Ireland. We're talking about child death and serious injury to children. Domestic violence is in the mix for a lot of those cases. So my second point is around when families leave um, a, an experience of domestic violence. And a lot of social health care, uh, child protection and welfare, and Garda Síochána, the, the drive is generally to keep people safe, and leaving is seen as arriving at a safe point. Um, again, somewhat paradoxically, the first six months post-separation is actually the most dangerous time for women and children. Um, the risk of serious and lethal assault, so the risk of serious assault and where assault results in murder, increases by 50% during that first six-month period, which is actually quite significant. And that's across all jurisdictions. It's not common to any one. Um, so in entering homelessness to get away from violence, women and children are actually, their, their risk of lethal assault is actually increasing, and our ability to protect them is actually compromised quite, um, quite seriously. So if we combine the first point about exposure to domestic violence and the second point about that uh, leaving point and entering homelessness. I refer back to what Fiona was talking about being that perfect storm, um, which is actually probably a slightly unfor unfortunate term to use because there's absolutely nothing perfect about it. Um, women and children choosing to leave home and enter homelessness, and I use that choosing in its broadest sense because it very often isn't a choice. Um, children and domestic violence and the impact on children is generally central to the decision that that woman makes to leave her uh, intact relationship um, with her abusive partner and to enter homelessness. But in doing so, and with some of the very unstable housing options that are there for her at the moment, particularly but not exclusively the hotel accommodation, her risk and the child's risk 
is elevated to a degree that's actually of huge concern to me and a lot of, of people who engage in research and practice uh, with children and families experiencing domestic violence. I think as well our mandatory re uh, responsibility um, to promote the welfare and protect children is completely compromised with the current housing options and with the current, I think, lack of engagement with the debate around domestic violence and homelessness and, and the need to make that link. And I think just to follow up on a point Fiona made earlier about uh, the gendered nature of domestic violence, that's very clearly been seen in the current rise, a huge spike in, in single parent families who are entering homelessness and with a significant degree of domestic violence in the background there. Um, so again, to add to what Fiona was saying, I think you have a very complex and multifaceted issue that requires an equally multifaceted response and a response that demands both a multi-agency and a multi-professional uh, um, and perhaps an intergovernmental inter response to an issue that is in itself um, quite complex. Thank you. Thank you both very much for the opening presentations um, and I'll take a number of uh, questions and comments from colleagues and we'll return to you then. Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thanks Chair and, and thank you both for the, the, the presentation and I suppose for those of us who, and there are many of us in this committee, who represent constituencies that have very high levels of family homelessness and uh, um, uh, uh, housing need. I suppose we've been working with many of the realities that you've been describing here, so just to confirm that's very much the picture that we're, we're experiencing in the constituencies. Our job in the report is to try and present as focused recommendations as we can, both to the Dáil and ultimately to the new Minister for Housing. And I suppose the more focused we can make our recommendations, the more chance that at least some of them, if not many of them, will get taken up. So my questions are, are really kind of having accepted the, the, the outline of your presentation. There's a couple of areas I'm keen to hear uh, your views on. W one of the, the, the things that I find... Um, sorry, Chair. Um, is because part of the responsibility for funding the refugees comes with TUSLA, uh, but the general housing policy uh, and long-term policy rests with the Department of Now Housing and Local Government, often there's a disconnect between the provision of services from when you go into refuge into step down and into long-term housing. So I'm just interested in you reflecting on, on is that a difficulty that's right across the system and do you have any recommendations for how we address that? Do we put all of those responsibilities in housing? Do we take some of the housing responsibilities and put them out into two -store? What's What's, the, the, in your experience, the best way to tackle that? I'm also interested in you maybe talking a little bit more, maybe just putting it on the record of the committee, that move from the refuge to step down to safe housing, just so everybody is very clear, anybody reading the presentations understand how that model works. Two, two separate points then. One of the difficulties many of us uh, deal with in the constituency office uh, are women uh, and children experiencing domestic violence where they are a private homeowner and therefore their ability to access uh, social housing supports of any kind is absolutely discretionary on the grounds of the local authorities. Some local authorities have a more sensitive approach, others have a, a very negative approach. Do you have any policy recommendations specifically in relation to how we tackle that? Same question for shared tenants in local authority accommodation, so you have the classic case of domestic violence within a shared tenancy, um, and the local authority generally sees that as a domestic matter which they won't get involved in, and they say it's a matter for the courts or for the Gardaí. And again, do you have any recommendations in relation to that? And the last one was just to pick up on a point you made in relation to the assessment of need. And obviously, centre of interest is one of the qualifying criteria. Are you saying that it's, it's your experience that local authorities are refusing to grant somebody an assessment of need away from what would have been their centre of interest, even though there's evidence, there's supporting evidence from referring organisations that that centre of interest uh, includes a violent partner? And again, do you have kind of specific poly policy recommendations in terms of, say, changes to how we do, or local authorities do the housing needs assessments that could fix that problem? Thank you. Thanks. Deputy, Deputy Coppinger, I'll take a number first before you reply. Deputy Coppinger. Thanks. Um, just like to welcome you to the committee. I, I am glad that we're giving this topic a, an airing because um, I definitely see a link in the people that I meet who are becoming homeless. Um, and not just leaving because of directly because of domestic violence, but vastly underreported. Because when you get talking to women, you actually discover that there's a, a history of domestic violence there that isn't necessarily the cause of their homelessness now, but has been in past relationships. 
Um, I think there's uh, such a, a trend in society of victim blaming and now isn't the time for a discussion on domestic violence but just there's also this constant invocation of why don't they why doesn't she leave which is a bit ironic now because um, it, it's it's extremely difficult for anyone to leave and we all know it's not as simple as just leaving because the point that uh, was made about the most dangerous time is actually when a woman leaves and in the period after that where partners um, follow up um, so ju just from what you were saying, you're, you're turning away, just to draw these things out if you like, um, you're turning away five times more families than you can cater for. And um, from like past interactions with the rape crisis centres and other you know, organisations that deal with violence against women, they also are suffering under cuts as well. And, We've had instances of refuges closing down. Now, nobody can see a refuge as being a solution, obviously. But um, it, it is what, what I've been hearing from refuges is that women can't get out of them. Maybe you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, they're blocking, it's like the bed blocker in the hospital, you know, which is a horrible term, obviously. But the fact that there's no places in refuges because of the homeless situation. This is a really serious issue for you know, the safety of women and children. And uh, probably at this committee, something that hasn't been drawn out enough is the whole child welfare issue of homelessness. Like the damage that's being done to children, psychologically arising from homelessness, but then if you factor in as well, if there is a history of domestic violence, can I just as well say, I've loads of anecdotal evidence as well of a lot of people having to stay, this has been brought out I think, in a house and they should, they want to separate but they just can't afford to and there can be psychological control and, and damage that's going on uh, to uh, the women in those situations as well. So just maybe you could just clarify are you aware of situations where women have actually been hurt because um, they were afraid to leave because they fall into homelessness? Could you maybe draw out that? Can you give any details? It, it, are we likely to see women and ch children facing serious injury, possibly even death, in the near future as a result of the housing crisis? Um, and you say that domestic violence is a leading cause of uh, women, children and young people becoming homeless. It's a pathway into homelessness. What, I mean, I'm assuming that the solution is, the solution is building houses that we need, not just building houses, but providing affordable uh, homes for, for families to be able to, to access. Uh, but are there specific immediate emergency accommodation issues as well? in terms of, like, that you need more houses provided in the short term for families too. Thanks. Th thank you, Deputy. Deputy Ryan. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I want to thank uh, Fiona and Stephanie for coming in to help us with our work. This is an important element of it. Um, you've described how the added problem of homelessness has, has kind of changed the, the crisis of domestic violence into a disaster when you combine the two together. But previously that you indicate that before the, the homeless crisis there was safe accommodation and uh, you know and accompanying services. If we're to address, uh, you know, if we could magically address the, the homelessness issue generally, would that would that adequately deal with the, you know, uh, get you back to a point where there's a reasonable kind of uh, level of support uh, and you know and. and um, you do say that while general recommendations around ending homes would benefit victims of violence, uh, you know, the, the victims are at risk from perpetrators. So there's more beyond that, is there, you know, you, you want us to do. And the other thing I do find attractive is one way of doing this is facilitating to a greater extent interlocal authority transfer of victims. I think that's very important. Um, 
need to get people away and local authorities. And, and there is a big barrier there, as, we, as you know well, and, and, and we know as practitioners as well, that that's a, a big problem for people in this situation. So that's basically it. Thank you. Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you. Um, I just have two specific questions on the people who are using your services. And one is, um, are you finding more men coming to you as victims of domestic violence? And the other would be in relation to the figures of national and non-national people who are presenting. Is it more difficult for people from certain um, non-national background, non-Irish national backgrounds, I should say, to present to you? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Butler. Um, thank you, Cahirlach, and I would also like to thank you for coming in and your submission. Um, uh, I suppose um, the, my question is around how are you funded? And obviously, nobody ever has enough of funding. You know, do you have to fundraise yourselves, or so? Just you might touch on that, please. Thank you. Um, just before you respond, I, I want to put this in context. This is this committee is a short-lived committee. It'll have a, had a lifespan of something like two months. Um, and the primary focus has been around the homeless and housing issues. And while we deal and we're conscious of a whole range of other related issues, like we're speaking about today, and we've also looked at, we'll just say, addiction and other areas. But the point I'm getting at specifically is the questions you've been asked, I suppose, from the point of view of practical recommendations that we would have an expectation that a minister could look at seriously. Um, and Deputy O'Brien and Deputy Coppinger spoke about, you know, what are the immediate next steps? Um, because it's not as though you can wait until there's a recovery in the housing market. So I suppose what we need to clearly understand and reply to the questions are, are there tangible recommendations that you would like to see this committee making? And you might identify those for us specifically during your response to the number of questions. Thank you. Can I respond? Oh, you could, you, <laughs> Actually, you can, you can respond between you. Take, take them whichever way you like. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, absolutely, Deputy. Apologies. Um, do you know what the, the overall level of funding reduction for the homeless service providers like yourselves has been, say, from 2008 to the present? What's been the quantum of loss from then till now as well? Yeah. The way you go, in any order, you feel free. I was just taking the last questions. Um, Sonus is very lucky. We're funded by the Child and Family Agency. As I'm sure you know, um, I think it was 2015, that a lot of domestic violence services were co-funded by Department of Environment via local authorities and the Child and Family Agency, having migrated from HSE Social Inclusion. And we're now, most domestic violence services are funded by TUSA, the Child and Family Agency. So we're funded by TUSA, the Child and Family Agency. Um, I'll probably get killed for this, but I mean, I'm not here to actually make an appeal for funding for Sonus or anyone else. I think what we're talking about is a much wider and bigger issue, okay? And uh, that said, of course, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the national domestic violence budget for the country is 16 million. I think that's what um, the DRHE spent on hotel beds just in the Dublin area for homeless families, and that's the equivalent for the national domestic violence budget. So, Does that 16 million include the services provided by yourselves? Yes. yes. That's the total budget? Yes. Um, and I appreciate, Chair, that we're not here to talk about domestic violence per se, but I think it's worth uh, looking at a point of comparison. Um, no, I think it was um, very simply, uh, Deputy O'Sullivan, you asked me questions around um, men as victims of domestic violence and non-nationals. Um, First of all, men do experience domestic abuse, as you know. Um, in terms of prevalence, however, the figures are, I think, seven times more for women than it is men. And in terms of actual the types of abuse, and I should say women and children, in terms of the types of abuse, um, the abuse suffered by women and children tends to be physical. It tends to be at the, the end of the scale that gets you into an emergency room, gets you into intensive care, and, like I said, gets you into a morgue. So the reality is, in terms of... I'm not for a minute, I hope, minimising the experience of male victims of domestic abuse, but from the point of view of a public health policy, they tend to be a much smaller number, and their experience of severe physical abuse tends to be uh, much smaller again. And the corollary of that is women and children experience domestic abuse in much greater numbers, and they experience much more serious repercussions in terms of the physical aspects of it. SUNUS at present works with women and children in terms of domestic violence. We recognise there are other organisations out there who work with men as well. I think maybe if I could just add yeah. to that, um, in terms of the current crisis and how this current crisis has emerged over the last year, 
Um, I would echo Fiona's point around male victims. We're very, very aware of that. But in terms of the current crisis that you have a responsibility to respond to, it is primarily and overarchingly um, single female-headed households. That's what the stats are telling us. The figures for male single homelessness haven't really shifted all that much over the last 15 to 18 months. What's spiking quite considerably is the single female-headed households with children. So I think that's why our focus has been on that. Yeah. In terms of non-nationals then, um, we would say, and I think Sunnis, because we cover the whole of the greater Dublin area and we are the biggest in the country, would be able to, and I say this purely from the point of view of providing you with an insight, 60% of our clients would be um, Irish, um, including um, Irish traveller, 40% would actually be non-national. And um, that would be primarily split between Eastern European and African and within those groupings. Perhaps um, you would be focusing mainly on Nigerian and Polish. And I think in fairness, that's reflecting the proportions within the population, the population um, in terms of prevalence. But also the reality is women and children who are migrants, and particularly those who are undocumented, are particularly vulnerable. I actually had this conversation with colleagues in Ruhama and the Immigrant Council of Ireland, and that's why they're lending their support to this submission as well. And I think we need to be mindful of that, that we are talking about, again, another level of vulnerability. Um, Can I just come in on sure. that as well? Just those March figures um, that we referred to earlier numerically, um, that particular piece of research identified three at risk groups. The first were uh, women and children experiencing domestic violence, migrants and young, particularly young women between, uh, young people between the ages of 18 and 24, 25. So my, uh, the migrant population, as Fiona said, are a particularly um, vulnerable population. Yep. Um, I suppose just looking at um, uh, the questions from Deputy Coppinger, you know, the reality is, um, and I'm explaining this purely so that you can understand the model of services, SONUS would provide refuge, but we would also provide outreach, we would provide visiting support, and as part of that visiting support, it's a homes prevention initiative, say for families who've experienced domestic violence but have just secured accommodation, because obviously this is a, a leading cause as well of, um, for women and children for basically um, ten lack of tenancy sustainment. It would also work with men and children in their own homes to avoid them having to go to refuge. We also provide safe homes in the community. I think that's different, um, Deputy O'Brien, to safe housing. Our safe homes are literally homes that are you know, relatively discreet in communities where women and children um, receive intensive support from us, but are effectively, um, they're an alternative to refuge, okay? And we would- Sorry, Is it support on site or is it visiting support it is, or is it a mixture? It's a mixture. It's an intensive visiting support for want of a better term. Our visiting support service also provides a dedicated crisis intervention service for families who are in homeless services. And we, we developed this model of service because we believe in starting with the woman and child. Um, we have a very simple response to this, you know, their needs shape our response. And primarily it's their safety and protection needs shaped how we develop services. But there's no denying for the high risk, um, high needs women, clients out there, they need refuge. And right now we have a situation where, and you described it perfectly and it was really astute, that we have a situation whereby Women, and women are choosing, and I say choosing in the broadest term, women are telling us that they would rather stay at home and manage, manage the abuse than face risking their children going into homeless services. And when I talk to you about abuse, I'm talking about, I'm not just talking verbal abuse, I may be talking about regular beatings, we may be talking about sexual abuse. There's a very high prevalence of sexual abuse in the context of domestic violence. You know, our services peak after Christmas because women hold it together so that kids' Christmases aren't disrupted. They peak after leaving cert, after the exams. So women and children, women are making sure that their kids doing exams are not disrupted. So I think you need to be aware of the fact that the current crisis, the homeless crisis, is stopping women and children entering refuge. For those who do decide to enter refuge, they can't, a lot of them can't get access to refuge. Now, we make sure that no woman and child leaves our refuge without being offered a service. And then when they're in refuge, our, one of our first key roles, our first work with them, is to try and find them a move on. Because we're aware of the fact that while they're in refuge, and again, no one wants to use the bed blocking analogy, but while they're in refuge, that's a place that someone else can't get. But where do we move them to? And it's not just about finding housing. 
That is a large part of it eventually down the line, but there is that interim step around that critical six-month period where we have what's called the need for step-down accommodation. Okay, so it may be a transitional point beyond refuge where there's still a high risk. And all of those, you asked for solid sort of recommendations to the committee. First of all, I would say there needs to be real conversation between the new ministry, formerly Department of Environment, and TUSLA, and the Department of Justice. We need real interagency working on the ground, similar to what they have in adjoining jurisdictions, you know, where housing needs, and I use that perhaps more appropriately, accommodation needs are reflected in any care plan put forward for high-risk women and children. The agencies need to talk to each other, but there also needs to be a fluidity in the accommodation stock that's out there. You know, we need basically, if there are, you know, if there is available accommodation, that it can be made available for step down. Of course, people will want to move on to housing and move on with their lives, but we have to establish risk and safety being the priority criteria for post refuge or any form of emergency accommodation like that. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in there? Yeah. Well, yes. Just on a question, you just touched on safe homes, maybe in a discreet area. So at times, might there be more than one family housed in the safe home? And do you need security at times? Is there, if you wouldn't mind, just a little expansion there? I suppose, it, first of all, this is a new service that we set up in response largely to this housing and homeless crisis as an alternative to refuge. And we pioneered it in the Dunleary Ratdown area with Dunleary Ratdown local authority. And I mean, I think they need to be congratulated on their farsightedness on this. And, um, and actually, Stephanie carried out the evaluation of the service, which was overwhelmingly positive. The reason why we set this up is that, my understanding is, in that area of Dunleary Ratdown, where there was a combined city populations of, say, the equivalent of Cork and Limerick, there is no refuge. There is four refuges in the greater Dublin area, in a population where one in four to one in three, depending on your estimation, for the population lives. So we came up with this alternative. And the reality is they're basically self-contained apartments or houses with usually apartments because they're on second floor, they become facilitated with security, they are outfitted with security, we liaise with um, a local Garda Siakana, we provide that intensive visiting support. It is a new service, it's getting off the ground. Um, and we, sorry. Just the security measures. There are security measures, obviously, but they're inbuilt. We outfit the units. So the reality is that you could take any suitable apartment, obviously, providing it's not a ground floor apartment, in an appropriate area, and you could outfit those. And that's what we're talking about having. You did this, as, sorry for interrupting you. You yeah. did this as a result because the, the refuges were full, so it was a, to provide additional accommodation. We did this in response to the fact that there was no there refuge was no. there. And, how, and, and I suppose you say it's a new service. I'm mm -hmm. curious, how are you finding the outcomes from it? We're, well, I'm going to, I, I can't really, I'm a bit biased, but I'm going to talk to Stephanie who evaluated the service. Um, well, I think one of the central and I suppose critical aspects of the service when we think about homelessness and domestic violence is that the solution isn't just about housing. It's about integrating safety and risk and supporting women and children where they're at. If, if where they're at is in their own communities or supporting them to move on afterwards. Um, I think um, a number of the women and children who participated in the research highlighted that they would never um, enter refuge with their child or children. And some of those reasons might have been because the child had a, had a disability or because they themselves had a disability. And as such, they were linked into a whole range of services within their own area. And to leave their own area to go into refuge meant that they would be compromising that network, which is really kind of holding the family together. So by being offered safe home in their own area, the child could continue to go to school, the family could continue to engage with the services that were absolutely essential for kind of normal functioning. Um, I think the intense nature of that service was, was something that was particularly highlighted in that there were women and children, women who, would, who, would ask, who had support five days a week, Monday to Friday, from the visiting uh, woman support worker, and the child also got one-on-one -on -one support. But the whole basis to that was around an assessment of need and risk so that there could be a robust and informed safety plan put into place for those women and children to support them moving on. So I think going back to an earlier uh, question that I think Deputy Coppinger you might have raised around the risk of injury and death and how that's linked to homelessness. 
I think if we only even just look at that six-month period, regardless of homelessness, that six-month period of an extremely vulnerable population, children experiencing domestic violence are one of the most distressed groups in the population of children in this country and, and further afield. So they're already very distressed in a very vulnerable and at-risk situation. When you add in homelessness, you're just elevating that risk. So you're just increasing what is already an established risk of serious assault and lethal assault. And there is research evidence, um, some of it here in Ireland, limited, more so abroad, of a clear link between serious and lethal assault, women and children being murdered in that six-month period. You add in the crisis of homelessness and you're just shooting up that elevator of risk. And I suppose just to echo Stephanie's comments there, that... Um, for some families, that's being near that centre of interest. So they may not be a high, the highest risk, but being near that centre of interest because of disability supports may outweigh you know, their need to get away. But for other families, for other women and children, getting as far away from where the perpetrator is and their extended influence, sphere of influence, is very important. I think that goes to Deputy Ryan's point as well there. I think Deputy O'Brien um, reflected that as well. We need fluidity. We need, um, you're asking for solid responses. Um, basically, like I said, TUSLA and the new department need to have that conversation. Again, domestic violence support services who are on the front line, who can bring that like, on the ground knowledge and shape those policy responses, need to be involved in that conversation. There, to a certain extent, I'm speaking for SONUS, but I know other services feel like that as well. We feel like we've been marginalised and that we're there looking after the women and children on the front line, but no one's hearing us and no one's seeing us, which is one of the motivations we had for coming here today. So that multi-agency response at both policy level and on the ground is one solid thing I would say to you. Also in terms of local authorities, um, to recognise that risk and safety are key determining factors, that they need to be criteria and that they outweigh centre of interest or housing need that in terms of actual um, responses, that what is required for victims of domestic violence for women and children is a, is a tiered response. Of course, ultimately, people want to live safely. Now, whether that's being able to go back to their own home with a domestic violence order, either a barring order or a safety order, or whether it means moving into local authority accommodation, that's down the line. But, you know, the reality is they have short-term accommodation needs you know, right now, and that we have a situation whereby they can't be accommodated. And that's what needs to be worked on. And so again, that's about thinking creatively. What is our housing stock? What can be adopted? What can we do to move those, um, those women and children on from refuge who don't need to be there anymore? And if they can go into general housing with supports or without supports, that's great. But what can we do to keep it moving? Um, again, I would say that there was a shortage there of appropriate accommodation ever before this homeless crisis, but this is just added and multiplied to it exponentially. Sorry, Chair, can I just ask? Maybe it can't be done. It can't be done now, but just for the information being sent, um, which we often ask groups. So, j just to clarify, that most of the families that you're meeting that are becoming homeless through domestic violence are single, women-headed households. Right. Um, maybe if you had figures on that, and the reason I suppose I'm asking that is uh, because there's often a thing about, uh, and it came up in the doll before about there's a reason sometimes why women don't marry the fathers of their children. You know that there are underlying and serious issues there, and then they enter a world of, if you like, poverty because of having you know, that situation, because we all are single parents. So just be interesting to see that and more likely to become homeless. And the families overall that, that son is deal with, um, how many of the women that you deal with would be from uh, just being like a married relationship or an unmarried relationship? It's just how many fall into homelessness. I'd just be interested to see that. I think they're really interesting statistics and um, I suppose we've just we've been collecting those stats for the last year or so and I'm happy to have a longer conversation with you and provide it. Yeah. But I think what's really what's really important for you to realise is that domestic violence impacts, you know, across all sectors of society. Okay? But the reality is if you're already facing multiple challenges, you know, around say um, say poverty, 
are, you know, are just basically, women are rational. Okay? People are rational, they make good choice for themselves. People won't come in contact, victims don't come in contact with our services unless they absolutely have to. They'll go, think of your own families, think of your own lives. Considering between one in five and one in seven women in this country would experience domestic violence at some stage in their lives, you know someone who's experienced domestic violence. The first person they'll go to is their own network, they'll go to, their, they'll go to families, they'll go to friends. So we're only seeing the tip the very tip of the iceberg. We're, we're dealing with the people who have to come to us. Now, because of the range of services we offer, if you're in outreach, you could be a homeowner in Balbriggan and you're coming to us because you want advice on what kind of court order you can go. And it may just be one contact. However, if you are a foreign national and you were in an apartment in another area, say somewhere else in North Dublin or West Dublin that we work in, you might want ongoing support because there may be child and custody access issues. So we don't, you know, we... We obviously are trying to build a profile of the, the clients that we work with, but we start with what their needs are, and then we work out to build that wraparound service around them. Does that make sense? Um, I know that, Deputy O'Brien, you were asking me a number of questions, and I, again, you're looking for those solid responses. I think local authorities really need to engage with the issue. We know that local authorities in the UK have. We know that some... Um, there are some instances where domestic violence could be grounds for a notice to quit. I mean, the last thing a local authority wants is whereby the victim of domestic violence leaves a three to four bedroom house <laughs> and the perpetrator resides there and she's basically with her kids in, um, in refuge if she's lucky and then in homeless services and then it's back on the local authority again to, to house that family. And I think we need to get, this is one of the things that I said to you, bringing it back full circle. This was our challenge coming here today to put to the committee to understand the role that domestic violence plays in creating homelessness for families, for women and children, and that we need that multi-tiered response, starting at national policy level, starting at that, you know, starting with homeless, the national homeless strategy that recognises one size does not fit all, gender-based violence does impact, it does contribute to homelessness, housing will form part of the solution for a vast majority of people, but it is not the only solution. We need a tiered accommodation response where risk and safety are at the centre of this response and that we need that multi-agency working. If I can just add to that, I think going back to the families most recently entering homelessness, um, I think about 80% of those families said that they had sought advice and support before coming homeless and that that advice and support was sought from the housing authority that they engaged with. So I think that's an, a window, um, a golden window of opportunity to actually engage with families and uh, integrate that risk and assessment piece. Um, Chair, you referred earlier to hearing a number of submissions earlier from um, uh, particularly around the area of addiction. I think with domestic violence, it's you're going to get the multi-layered, you're going to get addiction, you're going to get all of that other bit as well, which makes it more complex, which is why there's a need for a much earlier um, risk and assessment piece to fully inform safe housing, safe housing options. I think that's where it starts if you want a recommendation, that that risk and assessment piece needs to be done much earlier. Can I, just one final question, and then if everybody's... It's only a small question, and you, uh, you can take Deputy O'Dowd as well. Your own hands-on experience, how, how are you operating with local authorities? Do you have key, per, key, I suppose, personnel that you deal with who understand the issue and who are supportive, or do local authorities need to a better understanding? Uh, Deputy O'Dowd. The question was the same. I'm sorry I, I had to go outside earlier. Um, I just sort of feel that, that you use a very powerful language there because you're bringing home to me and to all of us you know, how serious an issue it is and the statistics you gave there. You know, I think you said one in seven uh, women in, in a relationship will, will, will physical violence. I find that absolutely shocking. I didn't think it was anything as high as that. Uh, I didn't think actually it was as high as that. I'm sorry, I don't laugh. I don't oh, no, laugh. I just, it's actually I don't, even this higher. Is not, so. This is not a laughing matter. I think it's a very serious issue. Uh, and the question I was going to ask you was, uh, in view of your involvement, and you mentioned Tusla and so on, and I've been interested uh, in the past about the Tusla reports in the Loudmead area about family dysfunction and all of this, a huge 
complexity of problems arise and obviously if family is in difficulty or relationship is a difficulty it has a very negative impact on everybody but particularly the children and obviously the, the person that's abused physically so in terms of the responses you're talking about and apologies again for being late uh, would you think in your response that you could tell us you mentioned the united kingdom where they have a, a policy response i think that i, I think from what you seem to say, it may be deemed to be adequate there, but wh how would we need to put together the best solution or the best plan to meet your needs? I think if you come back to us with that, and I wouldn't expect you to have it there, but I just say I, I applaud the work that you're doing. I was a teacher for many, many years, and I met lots of families who had very serious problems. And I, I know that when you can reach out to help somebody, as you do, it's hugely important. And as you say, when they go to you, they're in extremists. They have, they have, there's no other support available to them. They've exhausted the family support, the community network. So they really, it really is, you know, really, they're the most traumatised and most difficult cases. And I just want to acknowledge the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, um, well, first of all, I suppose to thank you again for your interest. I mean, Sunnis alone by itself worked with about 1,250 women and children last year. And again, I would say in a country where 80% of um, victims of domestic violence do not disclose to anyone their experiences, that gives you an indication of the sheer scale of what we're dealing with. But I appreciate you're here to deal with the home housing and homelessness, not domestic violence per se. And again, I would reiterate to you that in terms of the relevance to your work, it's a it's a a leading contributing cause to families becoming homeless. In terms of local authorities, which you were discussing, you know what the truth is? Um, it varies. I've met some amazingly inspiring, far-thinking individuals and local authorities. And then we have also engaged with perhaps, um, you know, ex we've had experiences whereby people were quite um, delineated. I'm being um, trying to be as... What's that word I'm looking for? As diplomatic as possible, delineated in what they thought their responsibilities were. And I think fundamentally what you're talking about here is an equity issue. It shouldn't, I mean, I realise this is Ireland, but it shouldn't have to depend on the quality of your personal relationship or who you know or whether such and such person has taken the time to gain an insight into this. I think there needs to be protocols. There needs to be standards. And again, I would refer the committee to Action 2.3 in the National Domestic Violence Strategy, which outlines you know, key issues or key areas to work on. But I think that we need to go beyond this. I think this is great, you know, get the, get the guidelines. Let's have that participatory, participatory engagement sessions as they're talking about here. But let's get real about what we're talking about. This was, this was two years ago. <laughs> and if we, it's great if we get this, but right now we need an emergency response. We need an emergency response on the ground, that tiered, safe accommodation for women and children experiencing domestic violence who are entering homeless services. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to say anything to conclude? Um, I suppose, just echoing the point I made earlier, I think domestic violence is rarely the presenting issue to a range of professionals, and that includes local authority housing. Mm. It's usually actually buried w way underneath a pile of other problems that are going on, including addiction and mental health issues. And I think it takes a certain skill set and a, ter a certain understanding of the dynamics of domestic abuse to actually ask the questions and to be brave enough to ask the questions. So part of it is around the professionals being interested. It's also about their training, their awareness, and I think about professionals working together. Mm. Um, and it's not the first time I'm sure a committee like this has heard that, about professionals working together and sh sharing that skill set and sharing that uh, understanding of those dynamics. But it does go back to a much earlier preventative point about when they're, when they're in danger of becoming homeless and the support that they get at that point. I suppose if I could just add in that, I mean, the work that we do isn't just responsive and reaction to emergencies, although that's, you know, part of it. We do significant prevention work. And domestic violence services are actually, at, you know, doing significant prevention work, stopping women and children and families from entering homeless services by providing those supports around domestic violence orders, for example, that, f that allow families to stay safely in their homes by working with two, so by working with Angarda Shiakona. And I think that's, again, the committee needs to be aware of that, the preventative work that domestic violence services do, as well as the emergency response. I would say to you that at the moment, Angarda Shiakona are looking at um, a standardised risk assessment tool 
for victims of domestic violence. It's called in the UK. It's called the Dash, the Domestic and Sexual Abuse and Honour-Based Killing Risk Assessment Tool. It's used by both NGOs and the British Police Forces. And um, Sonus would use Dash. It's a way of doing of assessing someone's risk, how much risk that they're at. I can't see any reason why in the future, once we have that standardised tool, that there can't be cooperation between housing authorities, between Angarda Shia Khanna, and between, again, in that context of multi-agency working to provide that, that safeguard, that wraparound for women and children at high risk of domestic violence and homelessness to find an appropriate accommodation response that keeps them safe. That concludes this afternoon. Ms Ryan, Professor Holt, thank you very much for, for your, your submission and your attendance this afternoon uh, and the, the answers and the engagement with the, with the committee. Um, while it's a very specific area, it does fall, particularly the aspect, one of the areas that the committee has been very concerned about is the risk of homelessness. And, you know, we talk about dealing with the crisis, but the first step is to prevent people becoming homeless. And it comes across a, a number of different areas. And in that regard, your presentation today falls very specifically into, the, into that area, the risk of people becoming homeless. Uh, colleagues, that concludes today's business. We're adjourned until Thursday, the 2nd at 10.30 a.m. And for those who are travelling to tomorrow, to, uh, we're meeting at 1.15 or 1.20. Yeah, just run us through the schedule for Thursday. Uh, I haven't got it in front of me, but in the morning we have uh, Minister Coveney, and in the afternoon we have the Department of Housing, uh, the uh, city and county managers, and we have Fingal and Dunleary. That's the afternoon. That's the afternoon. That's, that's the afternoon. Yes. Okay. City and county managers for a second time. Yes, we are. Okay. Plus Dunleary and uh, Fingal. All in, all in the one session. Um, I have to, probably in the one session because okay. the issues. Uh, will, a number of issues, particularly in relation to land banks and so forth, uh, we would want a perspective from the different local authorities. There's only one Dublin authority that, that no, we have. No, I'm, I'm, I'm it's out Dublin and Dublin City. Okay, sorry, two. There was two that weren't. We're now adjourned. Yeah.